Well, brethren, we are in the fall festival season. It's uh, our Feast of Trumpets is just a week away, and uh, we're already beginning to think about uh, the uh, the festivals, um, the Feast of Tabernacles, and all of that. By the way, uh, just for your information, the uh, uh, services for the Day of Atonement are going to be at Hillcrest Manor uh, in Big Sandy. I think that's where we had atonement services last year, wasn't it? So uh, that'll be at the same place. Um, that uh, uh, because atonement this year comes on a weekday, uh, we can't get this particular facility. So we'll be over in Big Sandy at the Hillcrest Manor. Uh, if any of you need directions, you can uh, check with Mr. Harm Dirks or, or somebody from over there. Well, we are right here in the fall festival season. And our attention is focused on that and on the meaning of these days, and that is certainly appropriate that, that we should be. I want to go into some things today that uh, tie in very directly with this uh, fall festival season, uh, with what uh, uh, part of God's plan and part of God's plan for us. You know, often we go into uh, the plan that God has for all of mankind and what's going to happen, and I want to look at that briefly, but I want to focus even on beyond that for us to understand a little more fully of what these days really picture and signify for us personally. Now, back in uh, the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 26, we'll pick it up in verse 20. Come, my people, enter you into your chambers. Shut your doors about you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. Behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Now, this is talking about the time immediately prior to Christ's return. The stage is being set here. This is the time of the day of the Lord, the time when God will come to punish the inhabitants, the time of God's indignation, God's wrath. If you go back to Revelation uh, chapter 6, it talks about as the seals are opened one by one, beginning with the false prophets and the war and the famine and the disease and the fifth seal, the, the tribulation, the martyrdom of saints, and then when the sixth seal is open, the signs in the heavens, miraculous signs in the heavens. And when you get to the end of Revelation 6, it says, Behold, the great day of his wrath is come. The time of God's wrath, of God's indignation. What is described right here in Revelation 26, or in Isaiah 26, is a, in that sense, a, a message to the people. God's wrath is going to be poured out on the children of disobedience. That's made plain in the book of Colossians. You see, Revelation 6 brings us up through the opening of the sixth seal, the heavenly sign, uh, then the great day of his wrath is at hand. Revelation 7 then is, introduces the sealing of the 144,000 who will be protected from the wrath of God. You see, the angels are told to wait, stop, not pour out the wrath of God until we've sealed the servants of our God. So at that time, the 144,000 are sealed, and this is, uh, in that sense, a sort of an allusion to that here in Isaiah 26, uh, because here, now, the wrath of God is going to be poured out. The Philadelphia church, of course, has already been in a place, uh, as it describes in Revelation 12, taken into her place in the wilderness to be nourished there for time, times, and a half a time from the face of the serpent to be protected. But here are others who have come to repentance, who are serving God, who have put their loyalty and their allegiance to God and not to the beast power that is dominating the world. Now God is going to pour out his indignation, his wrath, on the world, on the children of disobedience. He's, he will punish the inhabitants, and the earth will disclose her blood, no longer cover her slain. There's going to be an accountability for all of the righteous martyrs down through time. Now, what's going to happen? Chapter 27 continues right on. In that day, the Lord, with his sore and great strong sword, shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent. <coughs> Leviathan, the piercing serpent, is used here as a poetic description of Satan the devil, that great serpent, that old dragon, that great serpent called the devil and Satan. <coughs> so, the Lord is going to punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent. Notice what we're told in verse 6. He'll cause them to come of Jacob to take root. 
Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. As we come on down in verse 13, it will come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown, and they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria, and the outcasts in the land of Egypt, and shall worship the eternal in the holy mount at Jerusalem. Talking about a regathering of people, a time when Satan is going, first God is going to deal with the nations of this world to bring them to repentance. The wrath of God will be poured out on the children of disobedience. God will hold Satan accountable and will deal with him. The outcast of Israel will be regathered. Israel will take root and blossom and bud and fill the face of the earth with fruit. It will be a time of regathering the outcast, a time as it describes in Isaiah 35, verse 1, The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them. The desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It will blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. It says on down... Um, in verse 4, Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. The lame man will jump as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. In the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert, and the parched ground will become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. So it describes a time of physical restitution and healing, a time when people will be healed, a time when the very land itself will be healed. God is going to intervene. He's going to judge the nations. He is going to, re he's going to bring back the outcast of Israel. He's going to heal the afflicted. He's going to heal the land, the time of the restitution of all th things, the time of refreshing are at hand. Talks about back in Isaiah 40. Comfort you, comfort you, my people, says your God. Speak comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished. Her iniquity is pardoned. She's received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that cries in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. The mountains will be exalted, the hills and the mountains the valleys will be exalted, the mountains and the hills will be made low, the crooked will be made straight, the rough places plain. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. You know, we're told in verse 10, The Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work is before him. God's coming back. Jesus Christ is coming back to this earth, coming with a strong hand. His reward is with him, and his work is before him. There's a great destiny that you and I have. Christ is coming back to launch a work. Now, God works from the beginning. We're, you know, Genesis 1-1 tells us in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So God worked. God had a work going on. Jesus Christ said, I work and my Father works. Christ gave the church a work to do. We're to be preparing the way for the return of Jesus Christ, preaching the gospel of the kingdom to the world as a witness, proclaiming the warning message to the house of Israel. But when Christ comes back, his reward will be with him to give every man according as his work shall be. His reward will be with him, but his work will still be before him because he's going to set about regathering the outcasts and healing the people and healing the land. He's going to set about creating things new. God went on down, uh, inspired Isaiah a little later in this chapter, verse 18. Uh, well, let, let's, let's just notice in verse 12, speaking of the great God, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and meted out heaven with a span and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance 
who's directed the Spirit of the Lord or been being his counselor has taught him. No, verse 15, the nations are as a drop in the bucket. They're counted as the small dust of the balance. You see, nations, verse 17, before him are as nothing. They're counted to him less than nothing in vanity. To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare unto him? The great God, the great creator God, the one who's going to return and straighten out this earth, the one who has made everything. He that sits upon the circle of the earth, we're told in verse 22, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, stretches out the heavens as a curtain, spreads them out as a tent to dwell in. Verse 25, To whom then will you liken me, or shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold who has created these things that brings out their hosts by number. He calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might. For he's strong in power, not one fails. God brings out the host of the stars by number. He not only knows how many there are, he knows their names. He calls them all by name. You and I can't even begin to count how many there are. We can't even count the number we can see. And there are far, far more that we can't see than we can see. Astronomers have just come up with the idea just recently. Uh, they, they think they've discovered a new galaxy. One more whole galaxy that they didn't even know existed. And how many more galaxies are there that they don't even have a clue about? They can't count the stars they, that, that they, you know, the areas that they're aware of. God brings them out by number. He's got them numbered and he's got them named. And he's got a mind that can remember it all. Sometimes you and I have trouble calling all our kids by name and getting them in the right order. Uh, God calls all the stars by name. Just incredible. Our minds can't, we, we, we couldn't even begin to count that high. You know, God's got a mind that's bigger and faster than all the computers in the world put together and multiplied times themselves. It, it's, uh, you know, incredible. So God goes on. <laughs> Verse 28, Have you not known, have you not heard that the everlasting God, the eternal, the creator of the ends of the earth, faints not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. The great God, the creator, the everlasting God, he is the creator, and he is the one that is going to intervene in the affairs of this world. Now, with all that in mind, you go back to Genesis chapter 1, and you read about the creation, and in verse 26, amazing statement, Genesis 1, and God said, the great God, the creator God, the one that spreads out the heavens like a curtain, that brings out the stars by name. The great God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created him. God didn't make man after the monkey kind. He didn't make man after some animal kind. Man is not the highest of the animals. God made man after his kind. God said, let us make man in our image. When we read here, God made man in his own image, yet Genesis 3, we're, it's very plain as you go through Genesis 1, 2, and 3, God made man in his own image, but he made him out of matter. He told Adam in Genesis 3, he said, dust you are. You're made out of dust, Adam. And to dust you will return. You have a temporary existence. But God made man in his own image. You know, we might well say as we look at the greatness and the power and the grandeur of God, we may well say the words of the psalmist recorded in Psalm 8, What is man that you are mindful of him? For all of the vastness of the universe, for all of the galaxies and the solar systems, 
or the stars without number, or all of that, the focus of God's attention is this little tiny piece of rock that is rotating around the sun. This little tiny planet, as you would look at it, you know, pretty small, pretty insignificant in the overall vastness of the universe, and yet this is the focus of the attention of the great God, that on this little planet are human beings made in his image and his likeness, and in just a matter of a few years. His Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is going to come back to this earth in power and glory. He's going to establish a kingdom. God said, let's make man in our image, in our likeness. Notice back in Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Paul talks about in verse 10, to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifest, the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. God has a great eternal purpose that he purposed in Christ Jesus. Before God ever got started, he had a plan, he had a purpose. God didn't just create the world, sort of look around, scratch his head, and say, I wonder what I ought to do with this. He had a great eternal purpose. And when he brought the universe into existence, it was according to the eternal purpose which he had purposed in Christ Jesus, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Coming on down, verse 14, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened by might, by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. That is the great eternal purpose which was purposed in Christ Jesus. God is building a family, and the whole family takes its name from the Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. God is reproducing himself. God is building a family. God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Let him have dominion. There's a family that is being built. The family takes its name from the Father. And the eternal purpose will culminate in the fact that that family, those human beings made in the image of God, made of mortal flesh, made of the dust of the ground, might ultimately be filled with all the fullness of God. With all the fullness of God. You and I can't even fully grasp that. You understand. What do we mean, all the fullness of God? We just read a little bit back in the book of Isaiah about the greatness and the grandeur and the power of God, the great creator God, and the one who calls the hosts of the stars out by number, who calls them all by name. In Isaiah 6, God revealed himself to the prophet Isaiah in a remarkable way. <laughs> Isaiah 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood six seraphim, or stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, two he covered his feet, and with two he did fly. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I'm, a, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah was absolutely overwhelmed and frightened. He said, woe is me, I'm undone, I'm in trouble now. 
I have seen something that I know I don't begin to be worthy to behold. He saw in a vision the glory of the God of Israel. A tremendous vision of the greatness and the power of God. A number of years later, recorded in Ezekiel chapter 1, the prophet Ezekiel saw a vision. Ezekiel was a young man. He was a priest uh, that was in exile in the area of Babylon, living there by the river Kabar, or on the river Kabar. And one day, as described in Ezekiel 1 and verse 4, he looked up toward the north and he saw a whirlwind approaching. So first it looked like he thought there was just a tornado coming. But as he looked for a little while, it was apparent this was no ordinary tornado. As it got closer, he could see the flashes of light. And the closer it got, he could see this brilliant light. It was like fire enfolding itself. It was an overwhelmingly bright, brilliant, flashing thing that, that Ezekiel saw. And the closer it got, as it, as it kept approaching, he could see a movement. And then it was he could see creatures, living creatures inside this whirlwind. Then he describes them. They were, to our way of thinking, unusual looking. They had four faces and four wings. You know, if you had four faces, you'd always be going straight forward. You ever think about that? That's what Ezekiel said here. He said, uh, you know, he noticed, he said, they, they, you know, they never turn. They just, you know, whichever way direction they're going, they're going straight forward. Uh, that's what, They're in verse 12. And he describes uh, what they were. And he says the, they were bright and shining. They were like uh, burning coals of fire. They were like, uh, they looked like lamps. Um, it was, they, they went, and, and out of the fire went forth lightning. Uh, the living creatures ran, verse 14, and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. It's just incredible the speed with which they moved. It looked like lightning when they went somewhere. And then he saw these wheels within wheels, sort of like gyroscopes that were there uh, next to them. Then, as he was standing there and he was seeing more, this was getting closer and closer, he saw over the heads of these living creatures, described in verse 22, a great expanse, a great sort of a crystalline expanse. And they were under this expanse. And then above the expanse, verse 26, was the likeness of a throne. as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of the appearance, as the appearance of a man above upon it. He saw the color of amber, the appearance of fire round about within it. And the appearance of fire. And he saw, verse 28, he describes it as like a rainbow. And notice the end. Notice what we're told here, verse 28. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face. And I heard a voice of one that spoke. Ezekiel was absolutely overwhelmed, just like Isaiah. He was absolutely overwhelmed when he saw this. He just fell down. He saw the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. God told him, said, stand up. i got a job for you, something for you to go do. You know, back in the book of, in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10, <coughs> John is in the Spirit on the day of the Lord. John is transported in vision into the future, into the time of the day of the Lord. And as this takes place, he hears behind him the sound of a great voice. It sounds like a trumpet blast. And this voice says, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches of Asia. Now, what did John do? Well, in verse 12, I turned to see the voice that spoke. You know, he was transported in vision, and all of a sudden, as he's standing there, and, and just uh, it, at this moment in time when he is, as, as it were, transported, he hears a great voice. And he turns, and when he turned, he saw seven golden candlesticks, or seven golden lampstands. And in verse 13, in the midst of the seven lampstands was one like unto the Son of Man, 
clothed with a garment down to the foot and girded about the paps with a golden girdle. Now, you know, John had spent years, he'd spent a good three and a half years walking up and down the dusty roads of Judea and Samaria and Galilee with the one that was Jesus of Nazareth. John had spent endless hours sitting around campfires and eating meals and talking, listening to Jesus Christ explain things. He had heard the sermons. He had seen the miracles. He had also seen him arrested. He had watched him die. And he had seen his cold, dead body laid in the grave. And three days later, he stood at the door of the tomb and looked in. And he saw an empty tomb. John had seen the living Jesus Christ, the resurrected Jesus Christ, appear to him and to the rest of the twelve. He had stood there in the group and watched him ascend up from the Mount of Olives until he disappeared into the clouds and they could see him no more. John had seen that. He knew Jesus Christ. He knew Jesus of Nazareth had spent years with him, hours and hours and hours. Six decades have passed. Now, John hears this great thundering voice. He turns around, and he recognized the one that he saw, one like unto the Son of Man. He's clothed with his garment down to his feet, girded with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were as a flame of fire. His feet were like brass in a furnace. His voice was like the sound of many waters. It was like standing right next to Niagara Falls. We're told in the end of verse 16 that his countenance was like the sun shining in his strength. To look at his face was there was a brilliance, a glory, a radiant shine, a light that came forth that was like looking square at the sun. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. John was absolutely overwhelmed. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of the grave and of death. I want you to write down the things that you've seen and the things that are and the things that shall be hereafter. The great glorified Jesus Christ that appeared here to John. John understood what he was seeing. You see, many decades earlier, over six decades earlier, John, together with Peter and James, and the rest of the disciples were told by Jesus that some of them standing there wouldn't die until they saw the kingdom of God. A week later, John and his brother James, along with Peter, were taken by Jesus up into a mountain. And while they were there in vision, again, they were all transported into the future. They saw Jesus Christ in glory and power. They saw the resurrected Moses and Elijah in glory and power standing with him and conversing with him. They saw for a few brief moments of time the kingdom of God. And now here, as an elderly man, John once again is transported into the future and he sees the living, glorified Jesus Christ and the message that he had. Now, we're told in the book of 2 Peter, John saw the living Christ, and he heard a message. <clears throat> in 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter says in verse 10, 2 Peter 1, 10, Wherefore the wrath of brethren give diligence, to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an influence shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Entrance into the everlasting kingdom. Our destiny involves entering the very kingdom of God. 
We were created in the image of God, destined to be filled with all the fullness of God. We have, being, we have the way made possible for us to enter into the very kingdom of God. You see, the kingdom of God is going to rule over the earth. We read about the face of the earth being restored, people being healed, the earth itself being healed. That is the result of the kingdom of God ruling the world. The God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom. Our ultimate destiny involves literally entering that kingdom. Notice what we're told in Romans 8. In Romans 8, verse 16, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. You realize what that means? We read back in the end of back at the beginning of Revelation about the glorified Jesus Christ. We are going to be glorified together with him. We're heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. An heir is one who inherits. What are we going to inherit? Matthew twenty five. Matthew twenty five. 34. Well, notice verse 31. Uh, or, or let's, yeah, no, notice verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You see, in verse 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then will he sit upon the throne of his glory. Then will he say, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you. Now, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But our destiny is to inherit that kingdom. Entrance into that kingdom. We're to enter the kingdom. We are to inherit the kingdom. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ destined to be filled with the fullness of God, made in the image of God. God is reproducing himself. We read about the glory of God. Can we grasp, can we understand, because brethren, this is what puts everything and life in perspective. Our destiny is not simply to be a mortal human being living in a world filled with peace. Our destiny is not simply to live in a world where there's rain in due season and where the weather patterns are good. Our destiny is to be born into the family of God, sons of God, filled with the fullness of God, entering into the glory of God, entering into the kingdom of God, inheriting the kingdom. Notice here in Matthew 19. <coughs> Matthew 19. In verse 27. <coughs> then answered Peter, and he said unto Jesus Christ, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed you. What shall we have? We've turned away, we've turned our back on everything in order to follow you. What will we have? Jesus said unto them, verse 28, Truly I say unto you, that you which have followed me in the regeneration, <clears throat> in the time of rebirth, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that is forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. The twelve apostles were told that in the time of 
regeneration and the time of rebirth, which is the time when the Son of Man will sit in his throne of glory, they themselves would sit on thrones. They would judge the twelve tribes. They would be kings under Jesus Christ. Our destiny is to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. <coughs> Matthew 24. In verse 30, it talks about, Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Jesus Christ is going to return in full resplendent glory. His face will shine like the sun. And when he returns in his glory, that's when he's going to sit on the throne of that glory. That's when we will be told to come and inherit the kingdom prepared for us. Let's go on over and notice in Mark's account. You know, Mark records an interesting account, Mark 10. The mother of James and John had come to Jesus in verse 35, and uh, um, they wanted to sit, James and John wanted to sit on his right hand and on his left. Verse 37, sort of a modest proposal. Uh, we like the two top jobs. And Jesus said, you don't even know what you're asking for. He went on to tell them, verse 40, to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give. It'll be given to them for whom it is prepared. But you see, they knew, verse 37, that he was going to come in his glory and that he was going to sit on a literal throne. There was going to be a literal government. They understood that. In Luke's account, in Luke 9, the, uh, Jesus said in verse 27, uh, I alluded earlier to Matthew's account, but Luke records it as well, Luke 9, 27, I tell you of the truth, there are some standing here that will not taste of death until they see the kingdom of God came to pass about an eight days after these sayings. He took Peter and James and John, went up to a mountain to pray. As he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, his raiment was white and glistening, and behold, there talked with him two men, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory. Moses and Elijah appeared in glory. And they spoke and discussed what was upcoming. Peter and those that were with him, verse 32, were heavy with sleep, and when they were awake, they saw his glory. And the two men that stood with him, they saw that glory. And John saw it once again, over six decades later, as the glorified, resurrected Jesus Christ appeared to him in glory. So we see a description of the great glory of God. Now notice in Romans chapter 5. Romans 5 and verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access. This corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. So, if flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, as is explained in verse 50, then something has to take place. Now, John or Jesus said, recorded in John chapter 3, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again, born anew not a earthly birth, not a birth generated from human effort, 
a birth generated from above, from God the Father. Born not of the flesh, but born of the Spirit. <coughs> no longer to be flesh and blood, but to be born into the kingdom of God as immortal sons of God. This corruption putting on Im incorruption, this mortal putting on immortality. Notice what we're told in verse 40. 1 Corinthians 15, there are also celestial bodies or heavenly bodies, that's what celestial means, and bodies terrestrial, earthly bodies. So there are heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies. The glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. One star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. You see, God shines with a brilliant glory that just is overwhelming. We're told that when God the Father comes down to the earth, the time of the new heavens and the new earth, there will be no need for the sun because the glory of God just lightens everything. He's brighter than the sun. Jesus Christ, His face radiated and shone like the sun. That's what we're told in Revelation 1. You know, His, his uh, countenance shined like the sun in full Okay, that's one degree of glory. Now, you and I are going to share in the glory of God, but that doesn't mean we're going to be that bright, no. Uh, you know, Christ is going to shine like the sun. Maybe you and I are going to be like a star by comparison. Now, you know, you can look square on at the moon. You don't have any trouble looking at the moon. You can sure look at the stars. You can look at all the stars at the same time. You can look at the moon, big, bright, full moon. But when it comes to the sun, you can't look up and stare at the sun and put your eyes out. The glory is too overwhelming. Now, there are degrees of glory. We're going to inherit the glory of God, but there are degrees of glory, and that's what Paul explains here. There's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, and stars themselves differ from one another in glory. That's the way it is in the resurrection. The resurrection of glory. There will be degrees of glory. It's sown in, the re in corruption, it's raised in incorruption. It's sown in dishonor, raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. Sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. You know, it's just amazing. Back a few years ago, there were uh, a few uh, fellows that sort of uh, thought themselves to be scholars, and they came to the great conclusion... And since God was spirit, he obviously didn't have a body. Well, evidently they never read 1 Corinthians 15, 44. Uh, there's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. We're going to have, as just turn on over a few pages, turn on over to Philippians 3, verse 21. We'll pick it up in verse 20, Philippians 3, 20. Our, our citizenship is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Christ has a body. It's a glorious body, a spiritual body. His face shines like the sun in full radiance. You and I are to be children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, we will inherit the kingdom that has been prepared for us. Do you realize God is preparing the kingdom for us? He is preparing the new Jerusalem that is going to come down from God out of heaven where he will dwell. He is preparing that for us to dwell in. Christ told the disciples, I go away to prepare a place. And if I go away, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. I'm going to prepare a place for you. He said, in my Father's house, there are many mansions, many places of abode, many offices. The new Jerusalem is being prepared for us, and we're being prepared for it. And it's finally going to come down from God out of heaven after the millennium and the white throne judgment. But when Christ returns in glory... Our vile body, our body that gets tired, that runs down, that decays and deteriorates, that will eventually die and return to the dust, 
our vile body will be fashioned like unto his glorious body. You see, there's a natural body, but there's also a spiritual body. And just like there are degrees of glory, there will be in the resurrection. But it will be glory. We will inherit that kingdom. God is preparing us for that. Our destiny, the great purpose of God, is that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. That we might share in the very glory of God. Paul talks about in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27, that to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus Christ in us is our hope of glory. He talks about in Colossians 3, verse 2, Colossians 3, verse 2. Set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. You're dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. We will appear with him in glory. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. It became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Jesus Christ has went through what he did as the captain of our salvation. God is bringing many sons unto glory. A great destiny lies ahead. First Peter chapter 1, verse 21. Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Jesus Christ was given glory and he, when he, God restored him to that glory that he had before the world began. When he returned, in power and glory, we will enter that kingdom and share in that glory. So we're told here, Peter says in 1 Peter 5.10, the God of all grace, who has called us unto or into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you've suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. We have been called to share in the glory of God. 